their spring break. And so um, just to make you aware that it's changed, you might be interested to know that. OK. Um, and it, it, it changed generally, but it doesn't change anything for you guys for the next month or something like that. So you're probably not looking that far ahead anyway, is my guess. All right. So um, today what I'm going to talk about is, um, and this will be on the homework assignment that you have, is so-called regression and correlation. I know you guys have done regression, and that's the idea that if you collect a bunch of data, you know, like data points, let's say xi and yi, and here i is Are you familiar with this kind of notation? So it's crappy writing, but I'm saying we have a bunch of measurements of xi and yi. Okay? X is considered to be the input. Y is considered to be the output. We've done n experiments. This means i is a member of, it's an integer between 1 and n. Just to, it means the same thing as this. Just a little bit shorter, OK? So you've done n experiments. You've collected x versus y. And so, um, you guys, I know, have done this, right? You plot your data here, get a bunch of data points, and then you might use your calculator to fit a line, bet line on the data, right? Fit a line to it. It's called linear regression, I'm calling regressing the data. And so when you do this, um, the first assumption you've made is that x and y are correlated to each other. Like if you change x, it has some effect on y. If you change x, it has no effect on y. You say they're uncorrelated. Okay? So we're going to talk about both the regression problem. That's where we already know that x has some effect on y, and we're interested in like, fitting a line to it. And when we do that, we're interested in not only fitting a line to it, but so when you fit a line, I think this is the notation we use, you get something like this, right? K1 is the slope, K0 is the, is the intercept, right? So we'll be interested not only in finding these values, which you guys can already do, although I'm pretty sure you don't know how it's done, and I'll show you how to do today. We're also interested in, in confidence intervals on those things. So um, we're interested in knowing, okay, we found the slope of this line. What's the 95% confidence interval? In other words, we'll be 95% sure the true slope is in some range. Same thing at the intercept, okay? So that'll be the first part. And then the second part will be correlation analysis. So when you do regression, you've already established there's a correlation. If, if x and y are not related to each other, you don't regress the data because they're, OK? So um, we do correlation analysis. We have one variable x, another variable y, and we're asking ourselves, does x even have an effect on y? And as you might imagine, statistics, that means do we think it has an effect on y up to some probability or some confidence level, OK? So we'll talk about both those problems. So I think for the regression problem, the new thing will be actually learning how this is done, and then also how to specify confidence limits on the slope and, and um, the intercept and correlation analysis, I'm pretty sure will be brand new to you. All right. So we're doing experiments, and we're collecting data. Our data set looks like this, OK? X and Y. So for each data set, we collect x and y. X is, they're two variables. I mean, let me give you, what's an example? Um, I don't know. You change the concentration of some reactant A and you measure the reaction rate R. I, we'll go through some example like that. Okay? Um, you change the pressure or temperature. You observe change in volume, something like this. Okay? So you've collected this data. Um, and what you aspire to do is basically establish a relationship between x and y from these data points. Okay? And so when we do regression analysis, again, we, we've already assumed that there is a relationship. x is assumed in this case to be, I say, a non-random independent variable. So by non-random, I mean we choose its value. So when you do an experiment and you specify what the temperature is, we're assuming that you can do that and that's not random. Okay? And by independent, I usually use the word input variable. We're interested in changing this and observing the change in this. So this is the independent variable. This is the dependent variable. I'll often use input or output or something like this, OK? 
And so what we want to do here is to, is to quantify in a statistical way the dependence of the output y on the input x. Okay? Linear regression, if you will. All right. When we do x and y, we view both x and y as being random variables for the sake of establishing the methods. And then what we want to do is establish in a statistical sense whether x and y have a relationship at all. Okay? So you guys, when you do linear regression, I'll explain to you where the correlation coefficient, you know that thing, right? So if you fit a data, you get something called the correlation coefficient. You might call it the R squared value. And if that thing is close to one, then you think the data really fits a true line, right? And if it's not close to one, then you don't like it as much, okay? And you might, and you might imagine if R is really, really small, it's called the correlation coefficient for a reason. <laughs> if R is really, really small, like close to zero, that implies that there's not much of a correlation between X and Y, okay? So I'll, I'll give you some examples of this in a minute. Um, but it ends up that the correlation analysis is really kind of a hypothesis test. You're trying to hypothesizing whether or not there's a correlation and then performing a hypothesis test to see if there is or not, okay? So those are two problems we want to address. Okay, so regression analysis, you have these samples that you've collected experimentally, let's say. So uh, the index means experiment. So the first experiment, you changed x and observed the, ch the value of y and you got a data point called x1, y1. You did the same thing for the second experiment, you did little n total experiments, okay? And again, in this, in this framework, we're assuming that the input variable x is not random. Remember, we give random variables a capital Right, they're capital letters and non-random variables are little letters. So for the standpoint of doing this analysis um, and developing the method, we assume the input's not random, but the output is, okay? And therefore, what we're trying to do is establish a relationship that looks something like this, okay? So we're gonna assume, this is an assumption, this is the underlying assumption of linear regression, okay? That the mean, of y, y is a random variable. So we gotta talk about some measure of, so we talk about the mean of it, right? We're gonna assume this depends linearly on x. We don't talk about the mean of x because x is not a random variable. Assume we can specify x to be whatever we want. So if you will, this is the true underlying relationship, okay? If, uh, assuming this assumption is true, then underlying the real system is this relationship. There's a linear relationship between x and Oh, I hate myself again. <laughs> well, no, 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 I don't hate myself. Okay. Um, that's fine. I'm not even going to tell you why I thought I hated myself. It'll just confuse you. All right, so we're going to assume that the y depends linearly on x and that the mean depends in this way. It depends, on, so this is the mean of y it's a function of x, that's what this means, and this is a linear function like this, okay? If we knew the true relationship, we'd know the true intercept k0 and the true slope k1, you understand? So the first thing is the assumption, the relationship, the true relationship is linear, okay? If this is true, then there's a true slope and a true intercept. We don't know those, obviously. What we're gonna do is calculate from samples our best guess of what the intercept and slope are um, and then we'll also establish confidence intervals, right? So if this is the true intercept, we calculate what, the inter what we think the intercept is from samples, we'll have some confidence in that. If we have a lot of samples and there's a small variance, the conf confidence will be high, otherwise it may not be. So the idea here is, right, when you do this, this is where you start, right, I assume. You say, I have Y and I have an X, I need a slope and intercept, but the underlying assumption here is that you're, you're establishing the mean for this random variable and the assumption is in the first place it's linear, okay? All right, so we'd like to do, and I'm gonna show you how to do it, not all the way, but most of the way, is that, so these are um, the measured outputs, right? So when we do the experiments, we measure Y1 and Y2 and Y3 and so on for <clears throat> all the different experiments. And then, you can do this. So you have, an, you have a measurement, right, from the first experiment, you measure that. 
If someone said, I'd like to predict what the outcome of the first experiment is, this would be your prediction, right? I mean, you would take your model. I'm assuming you have K0 and K1 now. You'd plug X in here. You'd get a Y1. This should be X1 here, right? You'd take the model you have, the regression model. You'd plug in X1 for X. You'd get a Y1 coming out, and that'd be your prediction. That's why I put a hat on it, of what Y1 is for the first experiment, right? And can do the same thing for the second experiment. Whoops. And so on and so forth, okay? So for every experiment, if you had these, this model, meaning you knew K0 and K1, you could predict what the outputs would be, and we'll call those predicted outputs Y1 hat, Y2 hat, and Y3 hat, okay? All right, and this is, <coughs> this is one of the most common things in applied mathematics, okay? So what, what do we want to do here? Well, ideally, y1 hat would equal y1 and y2 hat would equal y2 and if that was true we'd assume we have a perfect model right so what do we want we want this to be true okay so this is what's known as a least squares objective you guys may know it as like the sum the sum of squares things like this so what we're going to do is the following so this j is an index on the on the experiment so j equal one means first experiment j equal two second experiment we're going to take the measurement for that experiment. We're going to subtract off what we think the measurement is or from given our model. Okay? We're going to square that. Why are we going to square it? Because we, we don't care whether the error is positive or negative. We simply want it to be small. Okay? So we'll square that. And then we'll sum up all these squared terms. Okay? So this is, uh, if you, this is a measure of how good the model is, right? If this Q thing here, this objective is small, you would see the model is good. It does a good job of predicting what the outputs are. If it's, if it's zero, it does a perfect job, okay? And we square this because, for example, in the first experiment, this error might be negative. In the second experiment, it might be positive, and we don't want those to cancel each other. So just square them, make them all positive, okay? So this is known as the sum of squared errors. And this is known as a least squares objective. In other words, my objective is to make Q as small as possible. How do I make Q as small as possible? Do a good job of picking the slope and the intercept, right? So those are the things I can adjust. That'll ad if I change K0 and K1, that'll change the Y hat values, and that'll change this Q thing, okay? So my goal is to pick K0 and K1 to make this thing as small as possible, okay? I, I hope that makes sense to you. How to do it's a different story, but conceptually, I want to minimize, this is called minimizing the sum of squared errors, or minimizing this least squares objective, okay? So this is what I'd like to do. Okay, now since I haven't gone to the next slide, and you know, when you get teaching evaluations, that you always get these different scores. You can imagine what my scores are like. Does know the subject five? That's, that's a joke, people. <laughs> Does he engage student interaction? 1.0, okay. So, um, so this is one of my feeble attempts to uh, engage student interaction. Okay, some student, please interact with me. All right, <laughs> so um, if you want to, so here's, here is a function, right? If you want to look at it this way, this function, Q, this Q is a function of K0 and K1, right? If you want to make that, if you want to m find good values of K0 and K1, what do you think you do to this, this function Q? Take the derivative with respect to what? X. No. Because those, you, 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 what you're doing is you're trying to find K0 and K1 that'll make that thing small. Okay, check. So you take the, you know, take the derivative. Well, I guess it'd actually be a partial derivative. You guys have had multivariate calculus, right? So, okay. So this, what I'm telling you is implicitly this function Q there, is a, it depends on Q, Q0 and Q1, you can see the equation there. And so what I'm going to do is take the derivative of this with respect to this, try to minimize it. Right, that makes sense from calculus. You know, if you have a function that depends on something you want to minimize or maximize it, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Now, of course, that doesn't guarantee it's a minimum. Or it guarantees it's an extreme point. You remember that? It means it's a minimum or a maximum. You're just going to have to trust me on this. You'll get a minimum. Okay? So this is what we want to do. 
take this function, take the derivative of this guy with respect to k0 and k1. In other words, make, try to find the minimum of this function with respect to k0 and k1. And then we'll have two equations. There'll be two unknowns, right? The two unknowns are, because we know that's the measurement, and we, we know the xj, yj values. They're given to us, okay? So the two unknowns here is k0 and k1. You get two equations, two unknowns, you solve them, you found that's, least, that's, that's linear regression, okay? All right, so let's see how you do it. Um, so now I'm taking the derivatives. This is an exercise in taking the derivatives, but let's just say I take the derivative of this guy with respect to k0, okay? So what are you going to do? do you, the sum the, doesn't matter, okay? Well, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, but you don't need to worry about it. So if I want to take the derivative of this thing with respect to k0, first thing I'm going to do is get a 2 that comes out, right? And then I'm going to take the derivative of what's, everyone knows how to differentiate some, some function like this, I hope. 2 comes out here, then this is to the first power, and then I take the derivative of k0, I take the derivative of this thing in the parentheses with respect to k0, that'll give me a minus 1. Minus one. So I'll get a minus 2 coming out of here, and that whole thing will still multiply this. You got that? Okay. So take derivative of this. 2 comes out. Take derivative of what's inside here. It's minus 1. So you get a minus 2 times this whole sum. Okay. It's not squared because that's what the 2 came from there, right? And if you want to do the same thing, so there's one equation. That equals 0. If you want to do the same thing with respect to K, Q1, ah, sorry, K1, take derivative of this with respect to um, k1, the 2 comes out. Now you take the derivative of this thing inside here with respect to k1. That's minus xj. Okay? You can't pull the j out of the sum, right? You can pull things out of sums that don't depend on the index. So obviously you can pull a 2 out because 2 doesn't depend on j, but xj depends on j. You can't pull it out of there. So that's why it's written like this. There's the minus 2, there's the xj, and there's the equation for that. Okay? So this is, even though you may not have done things with sums like this, this is nothing more than an exercise in taking a derivative of a function with respect to some variables, okay? All right, two equations and two unknowns here, okay? So obviously we need to solve these two equations, so that's what I'm going to proceed to do. So let's see, kind of next kind of sore, kind of feeling like I want to hang out up here for a second. All right. By the way, when I'm done here, I put, there's this giant group of footprints because I always put my foot up here. It's really a mess back there. Don't go look. All right. So solve this equation here. So what am I going to do? I'm going to write multiply or divide through by minus 2. That's fine. Then I just get this sum. You see this one term here, um, k0. So, so you can split this thing. I don't know how much you guys have worked with sums. I don't know. But obviously, if I have a sum that looks like the first one, I can take this minus 2 and divide through, and it's gone, OK? Then I'll get something that looks like this. I'm not going to write the index because I'm lazy. We know it goes. So there's yj. I'm just splitting this up into separate terms. Right? You buy that one? Just split the sum up. Okay? Into the three separate terms. Okay? So this one, not much you can do. This just says sum up k0 n times. It's the same thing as n times, ooh, n times k0. Right? And then this one says, do this, but k1 is a constant, so you can pull k1 out of there. And you get that. And hopefully that's the equation I've written on the slide. Eh, I guess it is, but I, I've written it slightly different, right? I have this term here and this term here on the other side of the equation, but that's, that's basically how, you, how I did it, okay? All right, I'm just trying to simplify the equations to get them in a, in a position where I can solve for k0 and k1. You can do the same thing for the second equation, divide through by minus 2. You get this sum, so this is the sum of xj times yj, that's right there. Then you get the sum of xj times k0. You can pull the k0 out, that's that <coughs> there. And then you get the sum of xj times xj, which is also known as xj squared. 
um, times k1, and you can pull that out, and then you get this equation. Okay, if you take care of all the signs, you'll get that. All right. Well, doesn't look like we're any closer to solving it. So <laughs> just kind of playing around here. All right. So there's a, there's a bit of a simplification you can do here for um, what this particular equation here. So I've just rewritten this equation here, right there. And then I'm solving this equation, which is pretty easy to do for k0, right? You can just take this term over here, move it over to the right-hand side, and then divide through by n, and you'll get this equation. And then those, those sums should look, those terms should look familiar, right? If someone said, what is 1 over n times the sum of yj? We usually call that y bar. It's the, it's the mean of y, right? What is this term here, well, it's k1, but then it's 1 over n times the sum of xj, and we call that x bar. So what does this mean? Well, it means if I, if I can find a way of finding k1, then I can calculate k0 from this equation, right? If I have k1, I can just calculate the mean of the x's and the y's, and then I can find k0 from this. All right. Now, now this is where I wish that... Um, I thought I had taught you linear algebra first, but I, uh, there was a reason why I did it this way. But I'll, I'll use this as a prelude to where we're going to go in the next part of the course. So let's say I want to solve this equation. So this is two equations and two unknowns, right? You agree with that? You see this, this set of equations up here? The, don't worry, the sums just are, once you sum these things up, it's just some scalar. That's just some number, the sum of xj. I don't know what it is because I don't know the xj's, but it will be. So there's one <coughs> equation that involves k0 and k1, and here's, a, here's an equation that involves k0 and k1, right? So two equations and two unknowns. <coughs> um, if we want... <coughs> Jeez. Sorry about that. Um, so there's two ways to solve this equation. There's the way you currently know, most likely, and that's take one of these equations like this one, solve this equation for k0, for example, take that thing and plug it back in this equation, you'll get a single equation for k1 and solve for it. I could do that. I haven't done it, um, but I could if you want me to. But I'm going to actually show you a different way to solve it because it leads nicely to the next part of the course, which will start in a couple of weeks. And that's to write it um, as a matrix, okay? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Maybe that'll just twist your mind into knots. <laughs> let's just do it the other way. So let's see if we can do it. I, I haven't done this. Usually when I haven't done things, it doesn't work out well. But let's just see how it goes. So I'm going to take k0 here, and I'm going to say sum of the yj, right? And then I've got minus k1 times the sum of the xj. I'm not sure this is going to work. This is a caveat, right? This may all... Okay, when I say this doesn't work, I don't mean it's going to be wrong. It will be right, okay. But it may not look like the answer I get on the next page because I did it the, another way for the, let's just see how it goes. All right, so there's, there's K0 in, in terms of K1. And now I can plug that into the second equation. So I'm going to take a shortcut here. Sorry, because I don't want to rewrite this thing. So that's K0 right there. And according to the second equation, I should multiply that times the sum of XJ. That's this thing here. And then what should I do? I should take plus k1 times the sum of xj squared and have that equal to something. The sum of xj and yj. Okay? Now, if you're a good person, and I know you are, you'll do the following. You'll gather terms involving k1. All right? So if we gather terms involving k1, we have this xj squared term right there. And then over here, we've got what? Minus 1 over n times the sum of xj, looks like. Right? That's all times k1, unless I've made a mistake. If I make a mistake, let me know. And then I'm going to put everything else on the other side of the equation. So that will include this thing, which I think is minus 1 over n sum of xj times the sum of the y, whoops, yj. That's, that's this term here. And I've already taken care of that term, and so apparently the only thing left is plus this. All right? 
Okay, well, you're done, but right? You, now you just have to divide by this thing and you've got the K1. So I'm going to do it, I'm not sure why. I want to see if it ends up looking like the answer I've got right there. See that answer I've got there? Maybe I can see it, whether it's true already. Um, well, I'll do it. So I can already see I need to multiply through by n. I'm just going to do that. And then in the numerator, I'm going to have 1 over n. No, I'm going to have n. Right? I'm multiplying through by n, so I'll have n times xj, yj. That's good. That's the first term I wrote there. And then I have minus this. I multiplied by the n, so I have minus xj and yj. That looks good. I'm pretty pleased with how this is going. Multiply n here. Okay. And then finally you have minus um, Yeah, what did, what did I do there? I knew this was too good to be true. Um, oh, sorry. It, that's just all I did. Is that right? No, 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 that's not the same. I know, but... Oh, yeah. So sorry. Can you see that? Because... I had the sum of xj there, and I had the sum of xj there. That's not the sum of xj squared. That's the sum of xj parentheses squared. <laughs> People are like, that's meaningful. Thank you. OK. Um, so that's where that came from. And now I've reached the promised land of, so you guys probably don't know this one. That's Latin for thus proven. OK. If somebody writes a famous theorem in the 1920s or something, they'll put this at the end of their paper. I'm, this is one of the greatest things I've ever done. So <laughs> I'm putting it right there. All right, so there's the K1 equation. And now if you had the guts, you could take the K1 and plug it back into, well, the original equation which I erased, and you could find the K0, okay? All right. Now, normally when I teach this, I teach it after linear algebra, and I could sh show you how to teach. I'll, I'll teach you maybe later how to solve this with matrix algebra. Okay? But anyway, there's the K1. And you might recall from the previous page, I showed you this relationship here. So a simple way now to find K0 is just take the K1 that you'd calculate from this equation, calculate the mean of x, the mean of y, and you can calculate the K0 right from here. Okay? Or you could plug it in and from the equation I showed you. Okay. All right. So, this is what your, when you do linear regression, this is what your calculator does. So, let's make sure we understand what is involved in doing this. It's not very difficult, it's just it's not very fun. Okay. So, we have to calculate all these sums, right? To let's say calculate what we just said here. So, that means that you have to calculate, you know, you have to multiply x1 times y1. Add that to x2 times y2. You have to sum all those together. You have to do the sum of the x's, the sum of the y's. You have to take each x value, square it, and sum all those up. You have to square the sum. You know, so you just have to keep all these sums. It's not, it's not intellectually challenging. It's very unpleasant if you were to have you know, 1,200 data points, though, to do by hand. But this is basically the calculation, this is the calculation that your calculator performs. You give it the x and y values, and it creates all these sums, and it calculates, and it spits back the slope and the intercept to you. Okay? All right. <coughs> so, yeah, we already talked about this. And so, this, um, there's an alternative way of representing this, which isn't reflected directly in this equation. Well, it'll be reflected on the next slide. It, using things called uh, covariances and variances. So, I'm telling you, and I'll explain this more on the next slide, this K1 is this ratio. It's also the ratio of the covariance of x and y over the variance of x. Okay, and on the next slide, I'm going to tell you what the covariance and variance are. Okay? All right. So these are, these are common quantities used in statistics, including linear regression. So these are what's known as the sample variances and the sample covariances. So to calculate the, everyone knows what this, the variance is already, right? If you want to know what the variance of x is, you take the x, each x value, subtract off the mean, square it, sum them all up, and divide by n minus 1. There's nothing new there. Okay, that's called the sample variance of x. 
It can also be written like this. I won't try to prove that, but I, that's where you conclude that this, these two things are equal to this ratio. You can do the same thing with y. You can take each y value, subtract off the mean, square it, blah, blah, blah. You get the variance of that. So those, those are nothing new. Standard sample variances, one for x, one for y. This is new, though. You can calculate something called the sample covariance. Okay? So in this case, what you do is you take the, for each x value, subtract off the mean. You do the same thing for y, and then you multiply those two things together, and you sum all those things up. So instead of this thing being xj minus x bar squared, or, or the same thing for y, it's value of x times the value of y. Sum all these up. This is what's known as the sample covariance. Okay? which can also be written like that. I won't try to demonstrate that to you. So it ends up that this expression that I wrote on the previous page here okay, can be calculated <coughs> from the sample as the ratio of the covariance to the, to the variance of x. I'm just telling you that. You just have to believe me. Okay? The reason I introduced these variances and covariances is because they're useful for other things we're going to do. As you're about to see, I'm getting a mint. I'm tired of coughing. There we go. I love these things, by the way. Needless to say, I probably have a bit of a problem, okay? Um, <laughs> all right. It, it could be worse, though. I could be pulling out crack cocaine or something. All right. <laughs> um, all right, so you get the idea here. So all we did is, just to recapitulate here, this is a key concept here. If the, our idea of what is the best estimate of the slope and the intercept of this line that we propose to get is the one that minimizes the sum of least squares errors. In other words, it makes our predicted values of y as closest to the experimental data as we can get in the sense we've defined here. You could also make this absolute value or cubed, not cubed, that would be a bad idea, to the fourth power. But this is common, right? This is our objective. If we make this small, we consider those values of k0 and k1 to be good. Minimize that by taking derivatives, get a couple of equations, solve those equations simultaneously, you get these answers. Okay? You can do it either with scalar algebra, which I did on the board there, or you could do it with matrix algebra, which I'll probably show you later in the course. All right. And then I'm telling you, not only can we do it this way, but you can calculate these from this, these variances and covariances. Okay? And these are going to be used later, so I'm just defining these, again, variance for each x and y, covariance involving x and y. Okay. So let's do a little example. Not that you haven't done many examples in your life of this, but let's see how it works. So actually, this is what I kind of depicted on the board, okay? And this shows the data here. 